Um, so I'm Deborah Gonzalez. I'm the director of the immigration here at Roger Williams University. I also am an alum from uh, the university. And our panel is going to be a little different, and hopefully um, we'll keep you awake. <coughs> Because uh, we're going to do a little dance while we're here, as opposed to uh, us going up individually. Um, so I'm here today um, with Magistrate Charles Levesque, who was appointed to the Rhode Island Family Court uh, in June of 2012. Prior to that, he was in private practice and was the assistant town solicitor for the, city, for the town of Portsmouth. He was also the former state senator for the 11th District, which represents Portsmouth, Portsmouth and the town of Bristol from 2005 and 2010. Um, and before that, he was a state representative for the 93rd district from 1993 to 2003. He's a former member of the Portsmouth Town Council from 89 to 93, uh, graduated from Loyola University School of Law and also URI. Um, by his side is my esteemed colleague, uh, Andine Galvez Sniffen, um, who practices primarily in the area of immigration law, specifically family based immigration. She's a graduate of Brown University and has worked as the legal director of the immigration unit of a nonprofit agency in Fall River, ILEAP. Um, in that capacity, for over 11 years, uh, Andine represented indigent immigrants from the South. Eastern Massachusetts region. She also trained and mentored several law students and is an adjunct faculty member, member here of Roger Williams University. Um, and in 2007, um, she was one of the first attorneys to respond uh, to the workplace uh, raid that had occurred um, in New Bedford, uh, where 361 undocumented immigrant workers were arrested and detained during that raid. Um, she worked with um, several other attorneys to get these immigrants released. Andine now practices immigration law. She's been doing it for over 20 years. Um, she's um, in private practice in uh, New Bedford, where she has um, her office. So our panel today is going to be talking more about the nitty gritty of special immigrant juvenile status, right? What Lenny has alluded to and talked a little bit about. Um, and it's great to be the last panel, because we can talk a little bit less and kind of give you a little bit more. because. Other folks have already talked a lot about uh, these things, but Special Immigrant Juvenile is uh, a form of relief that is granted to unaccompanied minors or to children who live in the United States who've been abandoned, abused, and neglected by their parents. Um, uh, federal law allows these children who have entered unaccompanied by adult to obtain lawful permanent residence by virtue of Special Immigrant Juvenile status, and this was granted to them really in the 19, uh, ni with the Immigration Act of 1990, but really only became uh, useful for, for many <coughs> practitioners uh, with the passing of the uh, William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008, <coughs> otherwise known as the TVPRA, um, and which, which expanded the definition of special immigrant juveniles um, to allow children who've been declared on a court um, or appointed by an individual whose reunification with one or both parents is not viable due to abandonment, <coughs> abuse, or neglect. And there is, um, there's a statute on it, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the statute. So it's 8 U.S.C. Um, 1101A27J, which defines a special immigrant as one who's been declared dependent on a juvenile court or placed in the custody of an agency or an individual appointed by a juvenile court in whose reunification with one or both parents is not viable due to abandonment, abuse, or neglect, and for whom the court has determined that it would not be in the best interest of the juvenile um, to return to the foreign national's juvenile home, uh, and the order of dependency and custody must be issued by a state court having jurisdiction uh, over the minor. This guy right here. <laughs> um, and so today we're gonna talk about what does that entail? What does that look like for us in Rhode Island and some of our neighboring states, very specifically Massachusetts, and how different they are, right? And how, here we are talking about federal law and we all think that this applies to everybody equally. But the truth of the matter is, when you're talking about special immigrant um, juvenile status, as Lenny has already stated, the first step, one of the first steps, is to go into family court to obtain this predicate order of abandonment, or abuse, or neglect before this child's ever able to go before the USCIS and say, hey, I've been abandoned, abused, or neglected, and I deserve to be classified as that kind of a person. Um, and every state really has their own um, 
jurisdictional laws, standing laws, age requirements. And so that's uh, what we're, we're going to talk about today a little bit. Um, this is going to be more of a, a conversation versus um, a just uh, up in speaking. So let me start. Please. Um, so when, when Lani was talking, Lani or Lani? When you were talking, it, it was kind of like, uh, you know, as somebody refers kind of to me in one of those boxes that you were seeking to avoid, um, <laughs> I do take that kind of personally. And then I realized that it is to an extent, as they used to say, the chancellor's foot. It is a question of who you appear before all the way along. The standards, and people talked about prosecutional discretion, the standards are greatly at variance. And that is a really unfortunate thing. Um, although, if you're appearing before me, I think you got lucky. If you appear before somebody else, you might not. So it, it's difficult for me to be harsh on it. There's a degree to which we're proselytizing a little bit. We're looking for people who would be interested in this area of law. And the discussion today has been uh, very interesting to me as a law student, as I still am. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit just about what um, Professor Gonzalez has just talked about. My court, I have kids come in, pretty much with an adult. These kids are as cute as buttons, <laughs> all right? And I'm actually going to mention to you, my court is every Wednesday at Kent County. I normally have two to three to four a day. And I would be more than willing, and I think all the attorneys who practice there would be more than willing to have you come in and observe. What do these kids have to do when they're in front of me? Well, they have to prove they're under 18, because the jurisdiction of the Rhode Island Family Court only applies to when you're up to 18. As Professor Gonzalez will say, we sometimes go around that a little bit, but we're very careful, because I don't want the gentleman who's looking into fraud to be coming at my doorstep. <laughs> Okay, and I, I do. I want it to be a legitimate process um, because really, as long as it continues to be a legitimate process, they should never look behind it at all. And so I don't want me to be at all a hindrance to the process going on. They have to tell me they're over 18. They tell, have to tell me, and I love it because sometimes I have 12 year olds, little girls sitting there going, and I have to ask them, have you ever been a member of a gang? Okay, have you ever been, uh, are you wanted or have you ever been involved in any criminal activity? Are you married? <laughs> Do you have any children? Now my friend Hans always there says to the people, I have to ask this question because of that guy over there. All right. They come in and they're somewhat intimidated because they haven't been in a courtroom before and the communities they come from, for the most part, the judicial system and the legal system is not considered a friend because it's not a friend. Okay. And then they have to tell me their story. And I'm not saying to you that I look forward to it. I see, well, I've only got 10 minutes. Nadine, you'll get to say something. <laughs> but I sometimes feel like an awful voyeur as I sit and listen to these stories because they are so compelling. They are so dramatic and they are so interesting. And that, you know, they're heartening in a way. So they tell me the story. They tell me the story of their life primarily here in Guatemala, but also El Salvador, um, some Mexico. They talk, talk to me about the abject poverty of the place they come. They talk to me about the violence in the place they come from. They talk about the, the problem of alcoholism, which is very frequently connected with poverty and the poverty of these people. Some are indigenous people. They talk to me about the violence from other people in their community. There was a discussion, why don't they go to uh, Guatemala, don't, why don't they go to El Salvador or something? Well, one of the things you have to, they don't like each other like the Germans and the Irish and the French didn't like each other. I mean, we see them as a monolithic group when they come to this country, but by and large, they are distinct groups, distinct personalities. But they come to El Norte, they come to, to North America, they come to um, United States and Rhode Island. I want you to think about the courage that it takes, because some of these kids are 14, 15, 16. The courage it takes to leave your home one day with primarily strangers. Usually somebody has come up with the money to hire a coyote, somebody who's going to transport, somebody you don't know. And as was pointed out, um, a lot of them eventually will commit violence against the people that they are transporting. Okay. Particularly, I had a woman, a girl, just the other day, who got raped along on the transit. I have to have them tell these stories because I have to find that they have either been abandoned 
neglected or abused by their parent. What does that mean, Judge? Well, again, um, I take the position that it, <laughs> well, quite literally, means what I say it means, but um, <laughs> usually I find, <laughs> here's the thing, in Rhode Island, I do not know that I could say the abject poverty of somebody not being able to support somebody's educational needs, probably I would not be able to say neglectful. And by the way, if you're doing family court law, I'm not talking about the type of standard that might lead to a termination of parental rights. I'm not talking about something like that, which is extremely high level. I'm talking about neglect, which can be unintentional. And sometimes, actually, in my decisions, I say specifically, because I have a child that's just really ratted out their mom or dad, or both, and said that they weren't able to do this, they weren't able to do this, they weren't able to protect me from the gangs or provide for my education, or even feed me. And I have to say, through no fault of their own. It is not a question of them not loving you. And again, I think we were talking at lunch, and I said, think of the love of a parent that has to, that's willing to say to a child, I can't support you here, go ahead go to America, try to go to America, with all the dangers inherent therein. If you get there, you have an uncle up in Providence that might be able to take you in. And the courage of a person to say that, and the courage of a kid to do it, okay. I find neglect in that. Sometimes it's not really an issue. Abandonment, sometimes I have, I have parents that split. They, just one of them or the other leaves, all right. It's not particularly unusual for their community. It's not particularly unusual for our community. I mean, the, whatever place you want to be in, husband, fathers, whatever, leave with a degree of frequency, and sometimes it's the question of the mother. Much less abuse, but there is cases of abuse, and they can be um, really disheartening um, that, that somebody in particular, because I'm looking at the mother and father, would do that to a child. I have death. People die from uh, diabetes, any number of them. I take a perspective of Rhode Island. That is, I am putting, no, I'm not looking at what is norm in Guatemala, which I would not know in any event. There's no conflict of law type idea. I say, all right, in Rhode Island, is this evidence of neglect? I make that determination. Judge, what about the, what about the concept that this, the, the abuse or the abandonment or the neglect isn't happening in Rhode Island? So what you're doing essentially is taking Rhode Island law and imposing it into <coughs> Guatemala and El Salvador and right Northern Triangle, which is, as Lenny has stated before, where most of the kids are coming from, right? We're imposing our laws onto their culture. What's, what are your thoughts about that? Again, you know, one of the things is, is that um, I am a Rhode Island judge ruling on Rhode Island matters. Um, however, the federal law basically controls, and it asks me to look at several aspects, and these are the aspects it looks at. And it says specifically, not that it's timely right now, but they have been a subject of abuse, or neglect, or abandonment. So I don't, I don't apply it. As a matter of fact, one of the determinations I have to make is that the person they walk through the door is a fit and proper person to continue having that child. So I am making no representations other than the fact that I do need to know information about the petition of the person who comes in with the child, that this person is a fit and proper person to have that child in the future. But, and there is, there is that problem anytime you're dealing with another nation, another culture, as to whether or not you're imposing values that you have upon that. Yes, I'm opposing the values of a Rhode Island Family Court judge, given the instructions I have from the federal government to a particular set of facts that appears before me. If they change those, I probably have to change how I do it. But that's the way I do. And the other thing I do is, you have been there, I normally default the other party. We do serve them. We are careful to avoid anything that might appear to be a sham or a fraud, but oftentimes we get a response from them that says, I'm not going to show up. I'm ceding my, um, my defense, if you will, to the court I'm throwing. And so, but I default them, because now I have no one but this place, and if they put on, if you will, the prima facie, the case in chief, whatever our, you know, statement is made to you, then I feel I have a right, an obligation, to grant that request. So you've posed a lot of interesting questions, one of which uh, you've talked about jurisdiction slightly, right, where you've stated that jurisdiction attaches at the age of eight, up and until the age of 18. 
Uh, but you've brought up this notion of uh, standing um, and burdens of proof, right, just ever so slightly. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. I kind of want to get on Dean into this conversation as well because there are significant differences between Rhode Island and our neighboring state, Massachusetts, which is really just a, a hop away. Um, and so I, I, I'd like to first talk about standing. So my first question to you, Judge, and you know, on Dean, please feel free to kind of jump in. Don't wait for me to call on you. <laughs> uh, I, we're not in law school That's or amazing. anything. Um, is that, you know, it, how does someone gain standing, right? Can the minor, him or herself, go to court and file this petition? And if not, what is the mechanism by which this case even makes its way to family court? Currently, the petitioner is considered the juvenile, although it's kind of interesting to me because traditionally it was not that. So I normally take it's the person who has come in on behalf of the juvenile as the petitioner. The requirement is that person has to live in the state of Rhode Island. Usually, if it's a, not the mother or father, then they seek a guardianship from one of the probate courts. A relatively, um, I think, simple, I haven't done it in a while, um, document to obtain. And then they come in and I describe them as guardian or next friend, or one of them as a mother and it's against the father, or um, father against the mother. <coughs> but if they're within the state of Rhode Island, if the child is within the state of Rhode Island, even under Rhode Island law, I have the authority to adjudicate the questions of custody and placement of that child. So for the purposes of Rhode Island, and Andina, I'm going to let you speak because I, I want to get to how it is that somebody obtains guardianship. So Lenny alluded to the fact in her fabulous graph, right, that the child, you know, first goes through the CDP and then they go through the o, uh, uh, ORR and then they're released to the family and then they go to the family court and the immigration court and USCIS and the I can't say it as fast as you did and as fabulously as you did, and Lenny. But in Rhode Island, there's another box that goes there, which is probate court, mm -hmm. right? And that requires that child to uh, serve the parents in the home country if there isn't some other mechanism of doing that. And, you know, due to the, the, the nature of how the ORR system works, usually I don't have to serve a parent in probate court because I have a power of attorney, but I don't have that same luxury once we're in family court, right? Once I'm in family court, I need to find a way in Rhode Island to serve, to get papers to that parent who's living in the hills of Guatemala, to have that parent sign that paperwork in front of a notary public and provide me with a copy of that, preferably the original, uh, but if not, hopefully a faxed or an emailed copy as soon as I have an order for alternate service. So mind you, now not only does this child have to go to the CBP, the ORR, they're going to go to probate court, then family court, then USCIS, then immigration court, before they ever see a green card. And so, Undine, how is that different in Mass? Or well, is it? In Massachusetts, we have um, joint jurisdiction, probate and family court are all one and the same. And so, um, I represent the child that's seeking the status. I don't represent the would-be guardian. Um, so it is essentially a self-petition because then there would be conflict of interest issues. And so the child still has to go through that process, but through the guardianship, um, there are forms already laid out that we need to serve on the parents, so we still have to go through that process. Um, the child through their attorney serves these papers on the parents. They sign a consent, basically a consent to guardianship that um, the court is going to appoint a guardian for this child because they're here unaccompanied. Um, so that's how you get basically an unaccompanied child, whether so does the court actually appoint a guardian, or is this, you know, say, the friend of the family, you know, as we've stated before, right? Well, the child will propose a guardian. Okay. Um, so it will be generally a friend of the family, uh, another family member, an older brother, an older sister um, that the child has designated, and the court will go along with it. So that's interesting, right? So is the child then not considered to have been emancipated by virtue of the fact that they're filing their own petition? Mm, no. Not in no. Massachusetts. Not in Massachusetts. And then up until what age does jurisdiction attach? Um, in Massachusetts, only as recently as 2016, um, it was the same as Rhode Island up until the age of 18. But in 2016, um, SJC in Massachusetts came out with a case Racinos v. Escobar in which they extended probate court jurisdiction um, to cover up until the age of 21. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that's equity jurisdiction. They found that there was this gap between what the federal statute laid out as relief for um, children in these circumstances and the access to the state court through which they could get it. And they could only get it through state court up until 18, and yet the relief was still available to them up until just before 21. And so through its equity jurisdiction, that's how they rationalized that they would extend equity jurisdiction up to 21. So now it's, and there's no longer need for a guardianship when you go from 18 to 21. Um, it's essentially just a, a request for declaratory relief. Any such thing in Rhode Island, Judge? No. <laughs> I knew the answer to that. I just wanted you to say it. So, um, I, Judge, a second ago you just you alluded uh, briefly as to what it is that these minors have to prove. But I'd like for you, if you would, for our audience, for those of us who, for those who don't actually go before you or haven't been yet, um, to talk a little bit more about how it is that you are able to make a finding of fact of abandonment, abuse, or neglect in these cases? Well, one of the things, it is a, it's a situation in which the other party has been defaulted. So I am relying essentially on one person's testimony as to the occurrences. Actually, and I was mentioning to um, Attorney Bremer before, because one of the attorneys in his office, it is a tendency to fall in love with your clients, and by the way, you will file that in almost any practice that you do. Your first meeting, you may realize they're a deranged, insane person, but after you sit with the person for a while, you actually begin to care about them and like them. Well, his co-counsel often comes in, and he doesn't seem to want to get them to say anything bad about their family, and a lot of times, these kids are reluctant to say something bad about them. They're talking about their mother. They're talking about their father. But I need that information in order to make my decision. But once they testify to it, I mean, I will admit, I acknowledge I am obliged to, to look at them and determine whether or not I feel there's any you know, subterfuge, any falseness, anything that indicates that they're not telling me entirely the truth. I've never even come close to that uh, with any of the kids that have been appearing before me. And, and by the way, I have done both criminal, when I used to practice criminal juvenile work, and I've done the, I've sat on the bench for it, and I, I, actually, I do know when kids are lying to me. I will tell you that almost all kids lie because it's survival. They just do, all right? People who tell you that kids are honest aren't being accurate, okay? But for the most part, they're just trying to survive. It's a very difficult thing being a kid, all right? And when they come before me, though, they're just telling me their life story. And they may have been assisted by the attorney, because there's also often, particularly, I will say Professor Gonzalez, there's also usually both a, a very strong memo and some very good affidavits, and I review those beforehand. But I want to hear their testimony, and basically I know they're telling me what happened. Would that, that's a difference in Massachusetts. There is no need for testimony. So essentially, it's the attorney who's um, drafting the affidavit with their client who is getting the client's story. Um, and, you know, obviously trying to get an honest story, but I believe it would be easier for the child to tell their attorney, knowing their attorney is working in their best interest, than a neutral fact finder like a judge on the bench. Um, oh. So they don't have to go through, uh, you know, direct examination. Um, once they're in the courtroom. And I can tell them that straight from the bat. You know, you need to tell me now, because this is the only opportunity, this is the only thing the judge is going to rely on is your affidavit. Um, so, yeah, that's well, all they and rely And Professor on. Gonzalez will tell you that. I have a lot of different stupid little things I do <laughs> when the, the kids come in, when the parents come in, because I realize they're uncomfortable. They're not stupid. Well, the thing is, but I will, I tell them to breathe, I even do, you know, I, I re remember Spanish won the first page, so I do know how to say que paso, como estaba usted, that's about the extent of it. You get to page two and I'm, I'm, I'm really treading water, okay? but, and I do, and, and usually there's something, and, and they, it's funny to me how, you know, a joke in another language or another culture is always kind of an interesting thing, but usually I'll make fun of the kid's hair or something about it, just, you know, just to laugh. Usually, 
if, you know, the, the father came in the other day, he's bald, the kid's got, you know, hair coming. So I make a joke about that. Usually that <laughs> tends to relax them a little bit. And so that I think they feel comfortable because I, I am assuming that they're not going to be comfortable. I can't imagine that they would be comfortable. So I, clearly Judge Wayne, we're in your courtroom and I don't know, on Dean, you said that um, when in Massachusetts this is being filed in probate and family court, but not a juvenile court. No. No. So in, but in Rhode Island, it's filed under the juvenile calendar. And so we have the family court in Rhode Island that has various other courts within it, the juvenile calendar being one of them. And it's, you know, I practice in Rhode Island. I've never practiced anywhere else. I don't practice in Massachusetts. Um, and so it was interesting to me to hear that, and, and of course, I've, as you've heard so far, right, the differences between Massachusetts and Rhode Island are significant. And then just recently, really as recently as September, I learned of all of the horrific things that are going on in family court in Florida. Um, and uh, I, was, I was sitting with a colleague, uh, Bertie Perlmutter, who's writing a fabulous article on uh, judges behaving badly. No offense, judge, I don't think he's talking about you. Uh, but you know, he cited in this, in this paper that he's writing about this case that he handled himself, uh, BRCM, which was a special immigrant juvenile petition that was filed in the, I, I want to say it was Miami, although it was Miami, I believe, um, where the court had an eight-minute hearing um, of which there, were absolute, there was absolutely no questions, no direct exam asked of the child, but for the attorney um, giving the court a brief synopsis of what the case was about, wherein um, the judge and the appellate court uh, who affirmed that just said that the minor was truly not abused or neglected under Florida law and that the sponsor was providing all the needs that the child uh, needed and that there really was no purpose for filing this special petition of dependency, which I guess is a petition um, for dependency. And in some instances, really, we don't call it that in Rhode Island, but it still is a petition for dependency because we're asking the court to make a finding of dependency of either the parent or the guardian. Um, and and I, I wanted to hear Your Honor's comments about this notion of re requiring services, right? Because in Florida they're saying, well, we're not going to grant these because you're not really asking us for services. Uh, and so I I'd like to hear from Your Honor as to what your thoughts about that are. Well, my, dis my decisions are described as custody and special immigration finding. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, really, it is a hybrid. The federal government has set out the standards, and I basically apply those standards so that it is, you know, custody. Now, as part of my decision, and by the way, it is 4 o'clock, and I won't hold it against any of you who leave unless you do so in a group. Um, <laughs> the, um, I do make a statement that the child would be entitled to services. Now, basically, I don't know. If you are in this country or in this state, you have a right to go to school. You can go to school, and as Mayor Laws has said, the law is very clear. You can go to school and you can... The law is very clear. You have to have a... You have to be let into a hospital if you, in fact, go to a hospital. I mean, that's a kind of a disaster. It's at the highest cost available, but you can't... You don't have a right to go to a general practitioner, but if you go to a hospital, they have to let you in. So the other services that we're talking about I mean, you know, if, it, if it's food stamps, it's kind of like, all right, do we as a nation declare war on children and say we're not going to feed you? No. All right. One of the things I have been problem or troubled by lately is that if I say you're entitled to services, and if I truly believe that what you have described to me is so traumatic, and I think it is, then shouldn't you be able to get counseling? Shouldn't you be able to get some psychiatric help? Especially because, I mean, our portion of this is, and children, um, we know that children subject to trauma, you can see their life problems go up almost per trauma. If you're abandoned or whatever like that, including alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, disobedience, missing school, cancer, finally death, early death. All of those go up per trauma. So, you know, I do think to myself that I'd like to order those services, but by and large, this is not a community that's seeking services. They do go to school, and they are very proud of going to school. And actually, that part of the testimony really is also very fascinating, again, as a boy year. They kind of light up. 
They have come here because they have desire and ambition. And I don't mean that in the bad way, you know, it's sometimes used. They just want to be able to do something. And they want to be nurses and doctors and lawyers, right? And so when that part of the testimony comes up and it's like, what's your favorite subject? English. You know, all right, great, great. But it's just so exciting. And I will tell you just one story. When, when they say their favorite subject is English, I tell them to learn English the way I did, which was to watch morning cartoons and read comic books. Because that's how I read it, <laughs> learn English. Yeah. So I, in, in gathering then these facts that, that, are, that are gathered, right, whether or not they're asking for services or custody, um, I'm, I'm curious to know what is in that order? What is it that, that is put in the order? You know, and I'd like to hear from the contrast of both states. Um, and then, Andine, I'd like to hear from you as to why is the order important? All right. So I'll go first, because you're going to tell you why it's important. Um, I do a decision from the bench. I am actually a very facile typer. If you can't type, learn to type, because it's a great thing to be able to do. <laughs> so I type. But basically, in my decision, I have all the predicates. And that's almost it. I mean, it's almost like, you know, your normal divorce thing. It's like, you know, you, you were here, you're underage, you are not a, a, a criminal, you're not married, you have no kids. It's in the best interest of this child not to go. They can't be reunited with their parent or spouse or whatever, their father, female or mother. They, it is not in their interest to go back to their native country, and it is in their best interest to stay here. In the middle, I will type in some specific facts. As ha has, has been brought to me. Now, I do that decision, but almost all the practitioners who appear before me then come back with an order, and I put order to enter. And that order lays it out exactly how they've been asked to lay it out by the immigration folks they're going to appear before. And so usually, though, it's, a, it's easy for me to know either half the time I remember it or just to look at it and say, yeah, those are the findings I made, and I signed. Okay, and then they take that order. Um. In Massachusetts, it's pretty much the same thing, except the judges have never given a written order um, in the cases that I've gone before. And I don't, and now I just practice in Bristol County. Um, it may be different in Suffolk County, it may be different out in Western Massachusetts, um, but the judges in Bristol County do not write their own orders. We need to prepare the findings for them, and it's basically the same thing. You lay out the elements needed um, to establish that. So in Massachusetts, are you laying out, because I know in Rhode Island, when I, I know when I prepare an order, you know, I will generally go off of what the findings were from the written order written by um, Judge Levesque, but I uh, will generally type up in very, with a lot of detail as to what the findings of fact were, right? Under 18, not married, mom abandoned because of X, Y, and Z, dad was abusive because of A, B, and C, whatever the case may be, and that's very detailedly detailed in the order. Is that the same for orders that are going in, in mass? Well, again, the orders go with the, re, with, with the entire packet. So you're, I'm going based off of what this child has told me. The judge hasn't even heard from the child, hasn't even received the case yet. They're getting a petition, and with that petition, proposed findings. And the judges never change those proposed findings. Um, and in those proposed findings, I'm doing everything that you're saying, you know, putting in details about the abuse, abandonment, and neglect. Because the unmarried, the eight, you know, under 18 or whatever, all of that is pretty standard. What CIS really wants to look at and what they can come back at you with are the situations of how come you know, why is this decision not more on point with respect to the abuse, abandonment, or neglect? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they can try and um, reverse the decision in that way, or deny your status, no, not necessarily reverse the decision. Two things about that. Um, some attorneys have asked me, because it's not uncommon, it is very uncommon, but it's not impossible for somebody to say, I prepared an order and ask me to respond immediately and sign the order. And usually, you know, I can, a quick review, they have proven their case exactly so I have signed it. But I do actually kind of prefer the idea that they actually listened to my decision, went home, came back, even if it's 15 minutes later. Um, but one of the reasons I do a decision is because if, in fact, and quite frankly, part of me doesn't think they have a right to look behind my decision. They've given me this authority. 
in, in principles of estoppel or res judicata or even full faith and credit would suggest that if you've given me this authority, I should be able to make the decision and then you just take it. If you want to find something different, fine, but what I've said should be fine. But, you know, I don't want to get into an argument with these people. I don't want... Uh, this is too important for the people who are appearing before me to have this go smoothly. So I'm just doing everything I can to make sure that if they look behind what we've done, they will say everything looks appropriate, fine, well done, and so they will move on. So I, I think then it's appropriate for us to move on to our, the, the real immigration part of this, right? Because up until now we've only been talking about family law, right? And it's interesting that as immigration practitioners, um, we all have to become well-versed in family law and understanding what that process takes. But, you know, we've now talked about obtaining a predicate order of abandonment, abuse, or neglect, which sounds a whole lot easier than it actually is, especially, and we're really lucky in Rhode Island, I think, but especially in states like Florida, uh, where it may not be um, as easy. But then we have a predicate order, and so what? What do we do with all of that, Undine? Okay, well, um, at that point, you then file this form, which is actually the I-360. It's, again, a self-petition where um, it isn't that somebody is asking for this immigrant juvenile to have a certain status. It's that immigrant juvenile themselves that's um, petitioning CIS, Citizenship Immigration Services for their status based on the predicate order that they obtained um, from the family court, probate and family court. And you fill out the form, um, you submit it along with the, uh, the predicate order that you have and any supporting documents. I usually include any um, country conditions to show that this is not, you know, aside from the judge's decision, here is further evidence that backs up the judge's decision with respect to country conditions, why it's not in the best interest of the child to be returned. Um, in many cases where there has been abuse and I have a police report from the other country, I will also submit that um, as well to CIS so that because they are going to be looking at you know, just this predicate order, it's good to supply some support for that. Order. And so what does the minor, because that sounds like it's just a form that's being filled out and submitted, what does the minor have to go through? Um, once it is filed, um, and there is no filing fee um, for minors, once it is filed, the minor has to be prepared uh, to at some point uh, certainly be fingerprinted if they're over 14, if they're 14 or older, and then uh, subjected to an interview. Um, that interview is just in order to get the SIJ status. Um, that interview will be with the CIS officer at one of the local offices in Rhode Island. It would be Johnston, and in uh, Massachusetts, it would be up in Boston. What does that interview look like? That interview will, um, it depends. It really depends on the officer. Um, up in Boston, they're, they're pretty, um, they, they go back and forth, but they can ask questions like, have you ever been a gang member? Do you have any tattoos? Have you ever killed somebody? Um, are you in school? How much English do you speak? How come you don't speak enough English? Um, if you came here because you wanted to go to school, let me see your report card. Um, and so those, I think, are questions that, in my mind, tend to go outside of what they need to establish um, in order to get this status, but at the same time, um, you know, they have a lot of leeway with these questions. They basically, they're the ones that are gonna determine whether or not this child gets this protective status. I know that um, as I've attended interviews in Johnston, uh, particularly in the Johnston office, which is where I practice primarily, um, I've had many minors who've been abused during their interviews uh, being what I would consider even almost harassed over their family member's status. So who are you living with? What is their name? What is their status? How did they come in? Are they married? Do they have kids? And so you tell the officer, well, that's not what we're here to do. And the officer, in, in many instances, has threatened me and my client who's sitting there to say, we're going to stop this interview and I'm not going to adjudicate this petition if you don't allow me to ask these questions. 
And it's really an abuse of power from what, what I've experienced, um, at least in the Johnston office, where clearly the line of questioning that is being asked on a, a, a petition to classify the minor as a special immigrant juvenile based on predicate orders that have been granted by the court goes well beyond anything that has anything to do with being classified as a special immigrant juvenile. And as advocates, uh, I know for me, and I know uh, Hans and Hillary feel the same way, I'm sure you do too, Andine, right? We really have been, and Denise, excuse me, we've really been having to push back, right, and say, no, 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 no. You know what, you don't want to give me a decision, great, don't, because I'm going to go file in district court that you didn't want to give me a decision. Um, but it's really been. Uh, Interestingly, um, in, in Massachusetts and Boston, there are certain officers who won't go that far. But more and more, I've started to see officers go that far. And what's interesting also is initially when you used to be able to file a simultaneous petition for SIJ status as well as for your green card based on that status, um, those questions were probably more justified because right. those are questions that you would ask of someone who wants to become a legal permanent resident. Uh, and I do still get those questions when they get to that next phase. It's just that right now you can no longer file those two applications concurrently. And so therefore the questions shouldn't come up at this stage either. Um, and yet they are starting to in Boston at least. Well, I think as, you know, as, as an American, nothing bothers me more than the imposition of arbitrary authority. Nothing. I mean, it really is, and, and I used to deal with young kids, juveniles, and we would talk about, you know, what's happening on the street. And I would tell them, look, there's an argument you cannot win. You cannot win an argument with a cop on the street at night. And by the way, the cop does not want to know your view of the Constitution, all right? <laughs> and all of you who are going to be down at Aiden tonight, Remember that. The cop doesn't want to know your view of the Constitution or whether or not he has any right to search your car. Right? That's the other problem. When you're an advocate in this situation, it may go up your back a mile that they are treating your client this way, but you need their signature. And it really kills me that it can be so arbitrary. And one of the things that I would suggest to you in my portion of closing here, because it's very, and I appreciate your patience, is that you know, one of the young women mentioned that we have to accept that this is the view of a country right now, that 40% don't trust Muslims and everything. No, we don't. We shouldn't accept it. It's not true. All right? Anything that's not accurate is not true, then we should not accept it. We have to have the conversation, though. And I don't think that conversation can be, you're an idiot, you're a bigot, you're a jerk. That conversation has been, what you have just said is not true. Communities with large number of immigrants have less crime. Communities of this type are not that. Communities that have more immigrants have a higher standard of living. All those things. Because one of the things that Mr. Trump perfectly did was not the question. He was himself, I believe, espousing bigoted things. But what he really laid it on was fairness. That the traditional communities, the white community, was being treated unfairly by all of these people coming in and by the minority community. It was not true. That, you have to go to that discussion though. You have to because most people I think it, you can have that conversation with. You can ha convince them that that part of it is not true. And yes, there are bigots in this country and you will not convince them. But there is a whole group of other people. All right? A lot of my friends like to consider, say that, oh, America is a racist country. Well, most racist countries do not elect a black president. I may not be clear on everything else, but that was kind of an unusual thing for a racist country to do. We have a great deal of racism, we have a great deal of institutional problems regarding our, treat, our, our reactions and, and whatever with race. But I do not believe we are a racist country, but we can, our country that sometimes can be fooled by, making, by people making arguments about fairness and abuses and otherwise. Thank you, Judge. I I fully agree with you. Um, so, Andine, I, I kind of want to go back to, right, we, we, I, I keep going back to Lenny's um, flow chart there. Um, and so I now want to get into the family court piece, the, excuse me, immigration court piece, because up until now, 
we've talked about you know probate court in Rhode Island and then family court in Mass in Rhode Island and then you know USCIS with these uh, 360 interviews. But where does the immigration court come in? Why is this? Well, um, the immigration court is involved because most of the time they've been detained when they come in across the border. Uh, because they start to, once they've been detained and released, um, they're released with a notice to appear, which essentially starts the removal proceedings. But they are allowed to delay those removal proceedings while they pursue this other avenue of relief. The courts know that they have to go to family and probate court and, and possibly ultimately CIS. But at some point, the court still has jurisdiction over these cases. Um, CIS can now grant the SIJ petition, the Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, and then rather than go to, um, to CIS again for your green card and be asked all these questions about, you know, are you a criminal and everything else, um, they can go before a judge and ask for their uh, legal permanent resident status in front of the judge because the court still has had uh, jurisdiction. But CIS is the only one that has jurisdiction over the um, I-360 petition, which is what gives them the special immigrant juvenile status. So, so it does have to be veered out of court and before CIS, and then it's a determination, do you continue with CIS and terminate proceedings, or do you go back to the court and ask for your legal permanent resident status to the court? So under the previous administration, uh, it wasn't uncommon for removal proceedings to be terminated and for, for us to be able to move forward with our petition with USCIS. Are you finding that to still be the case under this administration? In Boston, yes. <laughs> I think we're pretty lucky with the judge in Boston, uh, Judge Better. Uh, I don't know if Judge O'Malley now is handling some SIJ cases as well, but they will, they will not terminate. They will administratively close the proceedings, so it remains within their jurisdiction. And then once a visa becomes available, they will allow you to terminate proceedings. But with, um, with a trial attorney opposing over the trial attorney's objection. So, right, that. this notion of a, a visa becoming available um, is something that we haven't talked about just yet when we're talking about special immigrant juveniles. Um, when special immigrant juveniles came to be in the 1990s, I'm not sure that Congress really considered it much. And at the time, it was only being granted for children um, who were in, in DCYF custody, right, in state custody who needed special services. But with the passing of the TVPRA, this notion of requiring these services or being in long-term foster care was something that was done away with by, um, by virtue of the TVPRA. I think the issue with that is that when, in 1990, when this status was enacted, uh, because it's sort of this miscellaneous group of people, they've classified them as the same type of immigrant as an employment-based immigrant. So, right, we've, for immigration <coughs> law really has three types of, of immigration. So it's family-based immigration, employment-based immigration, and then diversity, right? And then we have humanitarian for asylum. Uh, but really the main two and, you know, the visa quota numbers as a result of, uh, you know, the Immigration Act of 1965 and then 1990, again, were related to this notion of, well, if they're going to be family-based, we're going to give this many visas to immigrants who are coming in. If they're going to be based on work, then we're going to give this number of visas. And within this family-based, we're going to give priority so that if you're the spouse of a U.S. citizen and you came in with a lawful visa, we're going to give you first preference. You're going to, you're the cream of the crop. We want you here versus if you're the brother of a U.S. citizen, you're probably gonna have to wait a little longer. And the same with employment-based, right? So employment-based, if you're a researcher, a doctor, you know, somebody who's in nationally, internationally recognized, we want you first. But then if you're a special immigrant, you know, we, we don't want as many of you. And in fact, we're gonna only allocate 10,000 visas per year. So that was done right in 19, 1990. And so now here we are, 2017, with I think what Lenny had just suggested, right? Eight, just 800 alone in the state of Rhode Island, SIG 
applicants. What I forgot what, what you said, Lenny, in Massachusetts was it? So right, so just Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we've used almost all of the visas in the fourth preference category. That's like 5,000 visas. And by the way, of the 10,000 visas that are allocated for special immigrants, and special immigrants run the gamut from the alphabet from subsection A to subsection apparently V, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and there's only 10,000 visas for this entire category of people with the first 5,000 going to religious applicants that really only leaves 5,000 for everybody else. And if there's 5,000 alone between Massachusetts and Rhode Island, people are gonna wait and these special immigrant juveniles are gonna wait years before they're ever gonna be eligible to. And the country cap. And the country, yes, because it depends. It depends on the country, right? So exactly, thank you, Lenny, right? There's a country cap of 7% uh, in, in that preference category. So it's, it, 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 it's the notion that here we have minor children who are coming to the United States uh, fleeing violence, poverty, um, abuse from parents, um, who are not entitled to work or even really be here until they're eligible to apply for their lawful permanent residence, which they can't do until there's a visa number available, and the wait today in 2017 is now two years. So now this minor who was 16, maybe turning 18, finished high school, can now not work or go to college because they're not entitled to work while they're waiting for a visa number to become available. And in the meantime, by the way, the immigration proceedings are waiting. Immigration court's waiting to see you. I, um, I just want to make one. The, um, there were, I think, some bananas out there when we first got here. No, but here's the thing. If you go into a supermarket, you will find that you can get three pounds of bananas for about a dollar. Okay. Those have to come from, I believe, primarily Brazil or Central America. They have to be grown, they have to be locked off, they have to be shipped, they have to be... There is no border, for, by and large, for products and produce or anything. Right after the Super Bowl, any number of kids in Rwanda all of a sudden were having shirts with uh, Atlantic Falcons, you, uh, Super Bowl champions, okay, because of There is no border for rich people. There is no border for capital. Those things go across borders without any regard. The only thing, and it's just interesting to me, the only thing that there really is a border for is labor. Okay. And that I find to be a really kind of frustrating thing because in this country actually they've made working people at odds with each other and really it is almost a new form of serfdom where you are stuck within a particular border for where you can work and do what you have valuable, but everything else can go across borders without regard. And I just ask you to think about it in a different perspective, because people say, oh, we've got to defend our borders. Well, I, I, if somebody's going to invade us, I suppose so. If people are bringing illegal substances that kill us, I mean, just remember, there's a market here, that's why they're doing it. So I don't know if you really blame the person that transports it here or the person who's using it, who should be treated. Okay. But here we are, you know, talking about this great edifice and all these rules and all these things you go through to defend a concept of border that probably was irrelevant about 200 years ago or 100 years ago. In the Civil War, most of the people who participated had never been 50 miles away from their home. I'm sure all of you, quite frankly, go to a Taco Bell that's 50 miles from here on a regular basis. All right? The concept of distance is totally different now. The ta concept of borders should be considered different. And we, and we really, I think, I would like to see people take a different framework, not, not support a, a really an arbitrary and capricious notion from the past, but start thinking about how we're going to deal, as one of the gentlemen asked actually earlier, about a world that really should be able to work together. Just my two cents, going back to the trauma and this delay in getting the green cards. Remember, this group of clients that we're dealing with, they're teenagers, most of them, and they've been through a significant amount of trauma. And you're asking them to behave for the next two to three years before they can get legal status in the US. 
and having done enough of these cases and been around for as long as I've been around, um, I can tell you, and having two teenage daughters of my own, I can tell you it's, that's not a very <coughs> easy thing to ask these kids to do. Um, as attorneys, we're in many, at many times social workers oh, yeah. for these kids. And that's another reason why, yes, we are proselytizing to a certain extent. We want to get more family law attorneys involved because I believe they're better equipped um, with connections to services that can help these children go through the stages and, and you know, behave for the next few years necessary, more so than I am. Um. <coughs> I, I don't know, Andine, if you want to touch upon the um, actual uh, hearing of the individual calendar or... Um, I haven't really... I have preferred to go to CIS uh. instead of going before the judges, but based on our conversation, it sounds like the hearing's pretty cut and dry and it seems pretty easy. The problem is I'm a private attorney and I charge different fees depending on which yes. venues um, so right that, up in. It, that makes a big difference because I work at the law school I'm the, the clinic director I don't charge a fee um, and so for me although it may be somewhat inconvenient for my client to have to travel to Boston to see the immigration judge it is more convenient for the client to go to the immigration judge judge Fetter who handles most of these cases in our jurisdiction who really doesn't ask any questions but to look at the application and say, okay, immigration granted, you know, the, the, the classification of special immigrant juvenile, the medical exam looks good because they have to do a medical exam making sure that they don't have any commun communicable diseases. Medical exam looks good. You've never been arrested. Biometrics have come back, right? The fingerprints came back that there's no criminal record. Does the government have any objections? Generally speaking, they don't. Approved. No direct examination, no questioning whatsoever, nothing. If I was at the CIS office in Johnston, my client absolutely would have been harassed about how they came in, when they came in, who did they come with, who paid for the trip, all of these questions that they shouldn't be asking in the Sidge case, but that they can ask when they're talking about adjustment of status. So it's, it's quite the different thing. So I, I see why it is you go to CIS, but since I'm not charging, I'm I'm going to court. <laughs> all right, I think that really um, is, is all we have. So if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to take any questions. I, I just wanted to make a comment, if I could. New York is, of course, different. Um, and I think we all agree that USCIS, since November, when they centralized adjudication in Missouri, has issued many more challenges. And so, Judge, I just wanted to alert you, for example, that one of the things they look for in these family orders is that they believe the person is only in family court or juvenile court for the purposes of securing status, that that is considered like a marriage fraud and doing it for the wrong reason. And so it's in New York, they have kicked back many good judges' orders saying they want to know what was the reason that the child petitioned for a guardian. And of course, there's many reasons like qualifying for health care or having someone who cares for you or clarifying the, the, the adult who's in charge of your life, um, it has become much more difficult and challenging at every level across the way. And so, you know, I think just you might want to stay in touch with your immigration experts who will then alert you of the news. No, I, I was just saying, they want to find out what's in my mind. They're, they're going into a vast wasteland, <laughs> and they'll never know why I decided anything. I t it's uh, interesting, Lenny, because some, some time back I did receive a request for further evidence from immigration on a petition I had sent out. And, of course, the, the, the order in Rhode Island that we prepare is very specific. So it says, you know, that, you know, the order the, that I, the judge, find the following. And then we lay out all of these facts, and then it's wherefore, right, not in the best interest to return, all this other language as required. Um, and the judge signs it, and I had received an RFE that said, Prove to me that the judge made these findings. Yes. Prove, prove to me it was based on law. Oh. Because the judge didn't cite any law. What? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. They're not lawyers who adjudicate Clearly. <laughs> and, and so I was out of my mind. I submitted the order again, and I'm like, hmm. 
So I don't know, like she's like an Article Three judge on the Constitution of the State of Rhode Island, and so therefore, you know, she, she made these findings. What are you gonna do, you're gonna go ask? And it was the chief judge at the time that used to issue these orders. And it was like, okay, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go ask the judge if she made, like, you don't believe her? <laughs> what are you telling me? What do you want me to do? And sometimes the requests for further evidence that we get are just so outrageous. I know I was just talking to Hans at lunch and he was telling me that, or it was Hillary um, telling me that they wanted the section. And now when I submit my SIG applications, I don't submit country reports, but I do submit the section of the Rhode Island law that states that the family court has jurisdiction over these matters. And you know, that was one of the RFEs that they received was, you know, please prove to me that this family court has jurisdiction. While we were here today, the apparently Office of the Chief Counsel of ICE is now asking in New York for complete copies of everything filed in family court, which is filed under seal. Mm, and for us when, too. And when the lawyer explains to the immigration judge and the ICE counsel, well, I can give you an affidavit or an affirmation or I can give you this, but I can't, I have to get an order from the court, I can't do that. The, I asked counsel said, well then how do we know it's not fraudulent? In other words, disrespecting the, the office of court responsibility that Congress gave the state. So as much as we want you to do this law, it has become uh, much more complicated. It, it means it's even more important to coordinate with experts in your in your jurisdiction and to be on top of the patterns. Yeah. I was just gonna say the same in Rhode Island with the ceiling. We seal it here in juvenile court, which I actually like. Because uh, I, I don't want, you know, Anybody people to have access, through. Uh, but nonetheless, when they do RFPS on that, you know, what do you do? It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Cause it, Again, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't want to get into a fight with these people. But there is an issue of full faith and credit. There is a, an issue of, of the fact that the, the Congress specifically gave this particular authority to us for these determinations, which are, are particularly not within uh, the, the usual processes of the federal government. And just remember, federal government, limited government, actually the family court in Rhode Island is a limited court, but it has nothing to do with family law, even though they tried to expand it into, uh, and Congress gave us this authority. So I think I would probably at least one time try to do full faith and credit. They're the ones that are actually given the authority over this. I'm going to court. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting ready. Okay. I, I also, right. we'll defend you. I, Let me know, Lenny, whatever you need from me. I also think that this admin, under this administration, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Right. I think this particular group of um, individuals is under attack. Um, so. Yeah. Just one other, because you're here in law school, I know it's like, you're getting a tool. You can use this tool for almost anything you want to use it for. You can, you can build a house or you can... If there is any place where I think it's good to, to practice is for this group of people who are underrepresented, who are, are needy, who through no fault of their own, and in fact, if you want to go back in history, probably largely through the fault of the United States of America, are uh, living in abject poverty at this point. If you just look at the history of our conduct towards Central and, and um, Mexico and Central America. so. So this is a good place. If you want to feel comfortable about the tool you purchased and using it, this type of law is very good stuff. Right, Hans? Right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.